Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. My name is host Mike Jokum. I am joined today by Bill Mullen from Wayne Taylor Racing. Bill, thanks for joining me this morning. How are you? I'm well. I'm fine uh, physically. I'm getting a little bored. <laughs> um, we uh, we missed the Sebring race, and uh, I'm, I'm itching to get back to racing. Yeah, I think we de- we definitely all are right now. But glad to hear that you are well. So you. At Wayne Taylor Racing, you in the shop, you're a rear end mechanic on pit lane, you're a driver change assist. So what is it everything that you do at Wayne Taylor behind the scenes and, and at the race? And we'll, we'll dive in a little deeper there. Um, well, at the race shop, I, I, I am a uh, mechanic on the race car. I take care of the, uh, the fuel system, uh, engine installation. Uh, I take care of the carbon clutch maintenance. And installation. Look after the headers. Um, I install the the back half of the race car when it's delivered to me from the uh, gearbox department. Um, they actually, the gearbox guy actually builds the back half. I do the installation, and and then together we all make a, a complete car of it all when it's all reassembled. And uh, also at uh, at the shop, I'm a machinist. I make little widgets and stuff on the lay and Bridgeport that we have in the race shop. Um, I was trained as a machinist as uh, one of my first jobs when I was much, much younger, um, which has, uh, it's really been a nice thing to be able to do for the various race teams I've worked for in the past. It's it's a nice skill to have uh, developed along the way. So, um, and at the racetrack, uh, as you said, I'm a driver driver changer assistant, um, which is a lot more uh, intense than you might think, because there's a lot of stuff to do in a relatively short amount of time. And uh, I never want to be the last guy done, because <laughs> that means everybody's waiting on me and the driver. So uh, efficiency in that is uh, is pretty important. So. And also at the racetrack, I, I am a mechanic, and I, I look after the same things I look after at the race shop. Right, basically. right. That makes sense. So on the driver change assistant side of things, you know, for for somebody who's seen it up close in person, it's a pretty remarkable feat. And even watching it on TV, just how quickly you guys get it done. How much practice goes into? Okay, all right, you sit in the car. All right, let's change drivers. You know, just in the shop or during a practice session just to get that down as efficiently as possible? Well, when we're at the track, um, we practice uh, under the tent or in the garage, wherever we may be. We practice uh, a few times a day. And then while the hot sessions are going on, usually whenever we put another driver in the car, uh, we try to make it a hot stop just to keep everybody up to speed on, on what's going on. And, and this year, for example, the only driver that came back from last year was Ranger Vanderzanda. So we had um, K- Kamui Kobayashi was there, but he only did the one race last year. So he was a little rusty. Um, and then Scott Dixon and uh, Ryan Briscoe as well were new to the way we do our driver changes. So there was, before the Daytona 24 hour, there was a lot of practice um at the racetrack and at, at the test we had beforehand um and uh it, it takes a while because those guys have their like frisco has been driving for uh ganassi's 4gt team and and they had their ways of doing things and you know we have ours so it took a little getting used to a different new routine for for everybody but in the end it all it all worked out really well yeah, you guys had a fantastic weekend it did yeah it went uh way beyond my expectations it was it was a great result and the, the same way in uh 2017 when jeff gordon drove for us he's a stock car guy and he had driven with us in 2007 so he was somewhat familiar with getting in and out of a sports car but he was so determined to to not be the slow guy that he came to our race shop along with the other drivers 
uh, a couple of weeks before the Daytona 24-hour in 2017, and um, we practiced for a good six hours of of doing driver changes at the shop. We had the car set up. We had a pit wall set up, um, and and he didn't quit till he was happy that he was going to be okay. And uh, uh, he he told us later he had a bruise on his butt from jumping <laughs> on the door sill of the car to get in and out. And, uh, and I was really impressed with how well all that went and, and how determined he was, dedicated he was to make it all right. So practice makes perfect in that in that situation. Yeah, that's that's really cool to hear how how determined he was. So you mentioned that sports car teams in general have a different way of doing driver changes. What are some of the intricacies that maybe we don't realize goes into what way that Wayne Taylor does it versus what way the Team Penske guys do it, et cetera? Um, well, some of the teams, the driver changer does uh, – everything the new guy gets in the, the second driver gets in and the helper um connects all the belts and quite possibly the, the radio connection as well but uh, in our situation the driver helps out a little bit um, because the cockpit in these things is so narrow and the headrest on the right hand side of the driver is so confining basically that i can't really see the uh, right hand shoulder belt so i need the driver's help to get that sorted out and connected uh, and then I start connecting other belts and uh, the, the the last thing I do is I start yelling radio radio because the driver has to connect the radio because it is like in the center right hand like near the driver's right hand right. leg and there's no way I can connect that so I start hollering radio radio and make sure I see him plug in the radio before I shut the door so uh, a good portion of that was new to, to Briscoe and, and uh, Dixon, and uh, they they all chuckled at first when I started yelling radio, radio, <laughs> just to remind them to plug it in, but it, it was effective, and it, it works, and in the end, uh, a 15 or 16 second pit stop to get those guys in the car is, is what we ended up with. Yeah, so it was a very good Rolex, and it looked like Scott and, and Ryan uh, assimilated pretty well, at least from from my point of view. But going back, I'm curious, how did you get started in motorsports? Where was your first gig? I, I obviously see a little bio in front of me, but I want to hear it from, from your point of view. Um, well, as a kid, I was always interested in cars. And um, I think the Steve McQueen movie, Le Mans, kind of sucked me in for life. I, I was enthralled by that. And uh, uh, I... I always had an interest in cars, and then I got an opportunity. My my brother, John, worked for a team in Atlanta, um, and he kind of put in a good word for me, and my first racing job was for a guy named Michael Bouet, who ran a team called Essex Racing Services out of Atlanta. And uh, they did SCCA stuff, Formula Fords, Sports 2000s, and, uh, but also they did uh, Camel Lights uh, GTP cars, which were the one step down rung from the, the mighty like Porsche 956s and whatnot. And uh, we ran a car called a Taiga, and then later on we ran Spice chassis with V6 engines in the Camel Lights category. And uh, pretty much, I don't know, about a year and a half into it, we, we won our first class race at the Daytona 24 hours in 1988 and uh I was just I was hooked and uh I've done uh 29 Daytona 24 hours now um and I've had good success and and uh having good success along the way has just made it all the more interesting for me yeah it, it um, looks you've we've worked on the Corvette American Le Mans program back in the Late '90s, obviously Wayne Taylor. It looks like you did some indie car and cart work as well uh, in the '90s at some point. Yes, yeah. Um, my uh, my first love was always sports cars, but I got an opportunity to move from Atlanta to Indianapolis to work with Walker Racing on a three car indie car team, um, and and that was right about the time we, my wife and I, had our first child. And uh, the the travel schedule with IndyCar was just brutal back then. It, it still is, really. And uh, 
So I, I got to Indianapolis and uh, I kind of had to start looking for a way out because of the travel schedule and having a new baby. So uh, I spent two years at Walker Racing. Um, the first year was with uh, Willie T. Ribs. That was quite an interesting year. And and uh, then I got an opportunity to uh, go to Riley and Scott and work with, that's where I first met Wayne Taylor, actually, okay. um, in 1996. Riley and Scott, Mark Scott and Bill Riley put together a program to run an Aurora powered Riley and Scott world sports car. And, uh, again, it, it was magic. We won the 1996 Daytona 24 hours and then the Sebring 12 hours and a couple of more races that year. And, and, uh, ended up winning the championship with Wayne. And that was kind of, uh, sparked a, a very long relationship I've had with Wayne and, uh, I'm, Still working for him today. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll wrap it up here with one or two more questions. First, what is it like working for a man like Wayne Taylor? Uh, Wayne is is one of the nicest guys you'll meet in auto racing. He's very dedicated to the team members. I I knew his kids as little kids in 1996 and saw them grow up and ended up doing driver changes with his kids. You know, I belted Ricky and Jordan into the car for quite a while before they left for bigger and better things. And, uh, it has been a, a real, a really good relationship with Wayne. Uh, he's always looking after the crew and the team and doing whatever he can to make sure it moves forward. Um, the addition of Konica Minolta, uh, has, has been a really good thing for the race team. It, it, it has been a very good good deal working for Wayne. It's pretty much in a nutshell. So you bring up the Taylor brothers who are pretty much celebrities nowadays, especially uh, with this eye racing stuff going on as as we're all from home and and they are being interviewed left and right. what What were the Taylor brothers like growing up? Did you think they would always be successful drivers as part of the Wayne Taylor program? And is it a little? sad almost that that they're not part of the Wayne Taylor program anymore and you see them being so successful elsewhere well um they I, I was really not that aware of the fact that they were uh go-karting and then they moved up into uh formula series cars and and whatnot and then they kind of burst onto the the uh Daytona prototype series uh at least Ricky did and Jordan was in a GT car and uh you could tell by the way they handled themselves from a, an early stage that they, they had the, the ability that they were going to be really good um, in the way that their, their mannerisms and their their actions around other people. And it, it was obvious they were going to be a lot like their dad. Um, I do remember one time when Jordan was driving for uh, the, the GT team he drove for with Bill Lester that he was afraid to come under the tent at, at Wayne Taylor Racing because he thought all other teams hated everybody else and, and that he wouldn't be allowed under our tent. But that was, you know, so far from the truth. We invited him in and tried to make him, you know, part of the gang. And I guess that kind of opened his eyes to what what kind of a team Wayne Taylor Racing was. So that started a, a good relationship with Jordan. And then he started driving for us later on. and. Um, it, it was very obvious that they were both going to be moving on to bigger and better things down the road from, from an early point. And yeah, it is, it is kind of sad to see them go. Um, but I, I am all for them moving on to whatever heights they can achieve. And I know they're both going to do really well for a long time in auto racing. Yeah. They're both, both successful and both young enough that they've got many successful years ahead of them. So I'll wrap it up with one final question here. Bill, thanks for joining me this morning. I, I really appreciate the time and look forward to seeing you back out at the track, hopefully sooner rather than later. But you've, yes. you've accomplished a ton in your years in racing. Is there one race or, or one championship that you haven't yet accomplished that you want to check off that bucket list before you retire? Well, yeah. Yeah. Um... I went to Le Mans with Wayne in 1996 and that was just magical, even though we, we broke about halfway through. And, uh, I went back, uh, three more times and never really had a good clean finish. 
and and that is the race that I really want to go back and have another shot at because uh, I feel I have unfinished business there. I like that one. So th- that would be the one. Yeah, I think that's a good answer, and I hope to someday make it over there myself to cover it. But Bill, thank you very much. I, I appreciate the time this morning. Uh, best of luck in 2020, and uh, I will see you at our racetrack at some point. Okay, I really appreciate the call, Mike. Yeah, no problem. Have a good one. Take care. Thanks. Thanks.